repurposing a bunch of sysom types on IP and stuff, wiping off glass, wiping off the talk to other servers. I actually, the other day, and in my day job, I work for you know, a large Linux company. But I'm here today to talk about the Linux kernel and the portability of Linux from one system to another. Now, I'm coming at this from the point of view of someone who worked in the embedded space for a long time, so building little gadgets that run Linux. Some of these little gadgets are actually quite large, right? People use the word embedded to describe a lot of different things. I mean, I think one of the largest systems I worked on that was technically embedded was a very large magnet, right? With a very small Linux system controlling a huge magnet. You know, you could fit three of them in this room, perhaps, okay? So just because we say embedded does not mean it's small. So that's kind of where I'm coming at for this talk. There's a kind of emphasis on embedded systems, but most of this is relevant to a wide variety of different kinds of computer system on which you might run Linux. The key point being, I'm not really a big PC fan, so you won't see anything with an x86 chip here. That's just to kind of point out to you that you know Linux is more than just a PC running Linux. There's a lot more to it than that. As I go along, you can stop me at any point with questions. And uh, I'll try to address them now. And if they're a longer question that requires a more in-depth discussion, then you know, we can defer it to the end, or we can uh, bring it up in pub afterwards. That also works. Now, this is labeled part one. And the reason I labeled it part one was very kind of pretentiously, because if this goes well as an overview introductory session, then I'd like to come back. Um, and actually have more of a hands-on session where we have now, I don't have one device for every person, but we'll have to work out the logistics, but it'd be fun to kind of have more of a hands-on session where we sit and actually, you know, compile up the kernel for different devices um, and get Linux up and running on them. So that's what you came for. I'm sorry, we're not quite doing that today. We are going to talk about that kind of thing. We are going to address the issues, but we're not going to actually do a hands-on session. Not this time. The next bill is fine in February. Sorry? So the next bill will open for that one in February. Okay. So if you guys if you guys enjoy it tonight, let us know. And I guess it's a threat as well, because even if you don't enjoy it, I might do it anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, shout if you hate it, and we'll try not to uh, do it again. All right. So let me use this system here. Okay, so the obligatory biography about me. I won't keep, I'll keep it brief, but um, long time Linux enthusiast. I've been using Linux since about 95, something like that. I was 13 at the time. I spent a lot of time doing embedded stuff. Uh, moved here to do enterprise stuff over at Westwood. Um, in my spare time, I write articles, a couple of books. There's a couple of really good books coming out on Linux very soon, and you're going to want to buy them um, because they have a feature of a guide. <laughs> This is on the cover, okay? So look for a book with this, all right? You want to buy that. Um, Maybe autographing those to make <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah, I can bring a few here. We give it, no, no. But, but um, yeah, so that's me, okay? That's it. Next slide. That's enough. Okay, overview of today. So, Linux system architecture. Let's talk about what Linux systems are. Let's talk about the different components of a Linux system. You know, where does the kernel fit in? Where do libraries fit in? Where do applications fit in? How do they talk to each other? You know, what is a Linux system? Keep that fairly brief. Introduce the Linux kernel itself. I'll do a very quick crash course in compiling a kernel, getting hold of it, and doing some development with it. A couple of example modules. Then we'll get into talking about the Linux kernel's portability. So if I have Linux now, and a new Wi-Fi router comes out like this one, um, and this is a, this is a, this is really cool. I bought a Buffalo one. If you guys saw Slashdot about two hours ago, you'll see a big story about these guys being sued over uh, Wi-Fi. So that's an interesting little anecdote there. But new device comes out. I want to put Linux on it. So how do I do that? What's involved? 
what does it mean to port the kernel? And what does it mean to build a complete system based upon that? So, you know, like, this is more than a Linux kernel. This is a Linux kernel plus a lot of other stuff that actually makes it do what you paid for, right? Because if it was just a Linux device, that would be cool, but a kernel on itself doesn't do very much. Not that you see anyway. And questions and answers. So if you have any questions, just stop me at any point, shout at me, um, get my attention, and we'll try to cover your questions as we go. So with that, let's get into Linux system architecture. Am I standing in the way? I think maybe if I... No? No, it's fine. Well, maybe I'll... Okay, well, that actually is kind of around that. You could probably just unplug it and unplug it. Yeah. Or empty. Or run around the desk. And do you know your partner. There we go. Right. Okay. Let's do that, because then I can... Make sure you can all see, I hope. All right. Okay, so I'm not an artist. You probably noticed that already. I'm really sorry about some of my diagrams. They are atrocious, but bear with me. This is as bad as they get. Um, this is kind of an idea, an overview of a complete Linux system. So at the bottom here, we have a Linux kernel, the core of the operating system. We've got these things here represent loadable modules, drivers, things that we can add to the system after it's been built and while it's running, okay? Um, and then we have, this is kind of in a dotted box here because then we have these interfaces. We have these defined interfaces here by which the kernel communicates with the rest of the system, okay? Now, these, these are stable interfaces, okay? So if I have an application now written for a Linux system, and when I say Linux, I mean Linux running on anything, but let's, for the sake of argument, say I have a big PC-type machine that is running a piece of software now. That same piece of software, I want it to continue to work in two, three, four, five years' time. And of course, we know that's true. We know that if we take an application from five years ago possibly by installing some compatibility libraries or something like that. But in general, we can install the application and it will work just fine. And that's because we have these stable interfaces here, okay? So there's kind of an edict from on high. Don't break that, okay? Because people will complain. If applications don't work anymore, people notice very quickly, right? Anything else, you can, you know, sound driver doesn't work. 100 people get upset. You know, no problem. But you don't want to get everybody upset. So this is very, very important. The interface is very, very important. So then, built upon this, we have our C library. Okay, so I'm talking about regular applications here. I'm not gonna kind of jump up the stack and go into the world of LAMP and web applications today. I'm talking about kind of old school stuff here. Um, we have our C library. Okay, and the job of the C library is to take all of this gunk here and provide us with a nice set of APIs, a nice set of functions, things that our application can call to get stuff done and not have to ask the kernel directly. You know, we like to abstract stuff where we can. Okay, so that's why we have um, C language and the C library that comes alongside it. Now, sitting above the C library, we have our applications. So I installed a program. Program uses the C library, C library asks the kernel to do stuff on our behalf. That's the defined order of things. Uh, except for these things over here, these are kind of special case exceptions to the rule, things that, you know, we're not entirely sure how to classify them, things that ask the kernel to do other stuff, like, um, you know, I want to control a tape drive, so I might have to use a special tool to do that. Um, there are some other things that kind of have a few exceptions there. One of those, one of those on recent systems, so on your desktops, is uh, the UDEV. Uh, UDEV, which basically handles detecting devices on your machine. You know, I plugged in a USB stick into my laptop, okay? So the kernel detected a new USB device. The job of UDEV was to go and figure out what modules needed to get loaded, 
okay, USB storage, put that in, send my notification further up into uh, my desktop environment, have the little window pop up containing the contents of my USB stick. But um, there are some, there's some applications, some utilities that kind of sit here a little bit outside. All right. Don't worry, it's fine. Okay. So examples of these things, applications include the GNOME desktop and everything that goes alongside it. They make use of the C library. Um, and the library functions that they call are usually wrappers. So I'll give you an example in a minute of you know, a very simple uh, library function that we can write just as an example um, to show you what I mean um, and how they abstract this interface between uh, the user and the kernel. Okay? And again, as I said before, the interface has to remain stable. That is not true once we get inside the kernel itself. So when you start looking at extending the kernel in new and interesting ways, porting it to new devices, making d d arbitrary decisions there, seemingly arbitrary, that change how things work internally, that's allowed. As long as applications don't see that change, that's fine. You know, we don't have a Linux driver model. Okay, so when you have a Windows machine, you get a Windows driver, okay? And the reason that works is because there's a stable interface within their kernel itself. They enforce various APIs within their kernel, okay? So if I have a driver that I'm given for a Windows machine, then I know internally there are various kind of guarantees with respect to how things work. That's not true in Linux, and the reason it's not true is because we want people to have creative freedom to change anything, anytime. We're trying to encourage people to open source their drivers, to put them up into the Linux kernel. If you extend the kernel, add a new feature, the whole system is geared towards encouraging you to push that back up, upstream as we, as we term the, the phrases used, um, to try to get this back into the official Linux kernel so that you don't have to worry about any of these things. Okay. So this is a little demo, don't worry too much about it, but basically I've got a little bit of code here and I'm using this little macro to find in one of my header files. There's a syscall macro I can use uh, to, sorry, do you have a question? Yeah, why are you using Linux slash unistandard.h not unistandard.h and user input? Yeah, this is because I, um, this is because this was this was tested on a on a power PC box. I had some oh. weird. Is, yeah, this is this is all right. See? Ignore that. <laughs> okay, pretend that's not there. But um, essentially, essentially, I'm calling a macro here. Okay, and I'm saying I want to define a new system call. So in this case, I would like to be able to find out what my current user ID is. Okay, return that information to me. So I can make a, I can use this macro that's provided in my system C library header files to define a new uh, system call. Okay. Now I'm not going to go through this too much. You can take the slides afterwards. They're on the website. Um, you can go through this, and you can see that in our header file, there's a there's a macro here. Um, we can specify what the function we want to use is called, and it will go ahead and look up in uh, the, the header file to find out you know, how it should call into the kernel to create this new system call. I don't want to kind of get into this too much, but we haven't got time to really dwell on it. But if you go through my example code later on, it's on the website, you can see how you can build up a new system call. Let's not worry too much about the internals, let's just worry about the fact that once we've added a new system call, to our system, when we call this program, we can ask the kernel something. So we can say, tell me what my user ID is, okay? And it will return that information. So having defined it, okay, I can now call get user ID. And what will happen here is my C library knows how to ask the kernel to perform this function. It will, it will ask the kernel, okay, what's my current user ID? The exact way it does that is kind of not important, but the result comes back. 
Okay.